welcome everyone to the League of Women Voters of Amherst 19th birthday luncheon, if I've done my math right. Our first annual birthday luncheon took place February 15th, 2003, on the 83rd birthday of the League. It was our president at the time, Eva Cashton, who initiated this annual celebration to mark the founding of the LWVUS, which was founded on February 14th, 1920. And we're so happy to be able to continue the tradition today, albeit virtually. But because this is a virtual event and it's open to the whole community to attend, um, I just want to give the regular league spiel and say that for those that may not be aware of our league's work, but probably most of you are, uh, we are a nonpartisan political organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government and works to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. So if you'd like to know more about the amazing work of the League that has been accomplished over its 102 year history, both locally and nationally, please go to our website at lwvamers.org. We're always looking for new members to get involved. So please consider joining us if you're not already a member. And I have two other quick matters. Uh, there will be a short survey for questions um, that will pop up on your screen at the close of the meeting. And we would very much appreciate it if you could fill it out. You have to wait for the meeting to be closed to see that pop up, I believe. Um, Kathy will correct me if I'm wrong on that. And secondly, after our, present, our speaker's presentation, we encourage anyone, of course, to ask questions. Please use the raise hand function, which you find in the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen. If for some reason you can't find it, just physically raise your hand and hopefully I will see you or someone else will see you and let me know that you would wanna ask a question. So our speaker this afternoon is Smith College professor, Carrie Baker. She teaches courses on gender, law and public policy and reproductive justice. She was a co-founder and former co-director of the Five College Certificate in Reproductive Health, Rights, and Justice. Her primary areas of research are women's legal history, gender and public policy, and feminist activism. She writes extensively for the public, not just the academics, as a contributing editor for Ms. Magazine and has a monthly column in the Daily Hampshire Gazette, to name just a couple. And she's published three books, including a textbook on sexual harassment law. One of the qualities I most admire in Professor Baker is her presence and her active contributions to matters that affect us at this juncture in time. She brings her scholarship to bear on the topics of the moment. Some of her more recent articles are abortion regulation in the time of COVID-19 and how does climate change uniquely threaten women? All of this is meant to merely frame how very lucky we are to have her as our speaker today. And I also want to note that our annual contribution to the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Mass's Row event will this year be made in Professor Baker's honor in appreciation for all the work that she does. So with that, I'd like to hand things over to Professor Baker. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I used to be president of the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Mass, and I'm still on the advisory board. So that's wonderful. I really, really appreciate that. That's wonderful news. So I've been asked to speak about 30 minutes and then to take questions for 30 minutes. And I'm going to use a PowerPoint because to make it a little more uh, lively with images and some words. And I, while my focus will be kind of where we are with regard to reproductive rights, I'm going to um, begin and end a little with different issues just to give a bit of a range. I'm going to actually end with the Equal Rights Amendment um, and say a little bit about where we are right now on the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and I'm going to start, okay, hopefully everybody can see that now. I'm going to start by something that happened on Thursday. I don't know if you saw this, but it's actually hugely, hugely significant. On Thursday, the Senate passed a law called the Ending Forced Arbitration Act. This is the first time that Congress has passed any legislation in response to the Me Too movement. This is a law that prohibits employers from requiring employees to sign away their rights to go to court with regard to sexual harassment claims. Many, many employers for many years 
have said, well, I'll hire you, but you have to agree that if you have a sexual harassment case, that you will go into private arbitration run by somebody that I hire, I being the employer. And that's a very skewed um, process. And also part of that is they're able to keep claims hidden. So people don't know that the company has claims of sexual harassment against them. And this became a major target in the Me Too movement because this is in part how Harvey Weinstein managed to continue to abuse women for so many years. And what um, this is a congressional act. So the House passed it a while ago, but it had been filibustered in the Senate. And Gretchen Carlson, whose story was the basis of the movie Bombshell, if any of you saw this movie, came out a few years ago. When Gretchen Carlson was a commentator on Fox News, she experienced tremendous sexual harassment and she spoke out about it. And the movie is sort of a fictionalized version of her story. And it's it's pretty good. I wrote a review for Ms. of it. Um, you know, it's I had some criticisms, but overall it was pretty good. And it certainly raised awareness about the issue. And so apparently she was the engine behind getting Republicans on board to break the filibuster and pass this legislation, which I think is so interesting. Um, she got Lindsey Graham on board and some other Republican members of the Senate. And so Thursday they passed it and it's going to Biden's desk and he will sign it. And um, I, the reason I think it's so significant is one, because that's a huge issue. Two, um, it's the first congressional legislation on sexual harassment in years. But three, nothing's passing the Senate right now, particularly women's rights bills. Everything is blocked up by the filibuster, uh, voting rights, everything. And so the fact that this passed is huge. And so on, I just, this is some good news. <laughs> I want to, I don't want to be too negative. So this is some really good news that I wanted to make sure was on people's radar screen. And I'm, I'm working on a piece for Ms. right now on this, and it should be out by early next week. If you want more details, so you can go to my author page at Ms. and I'll fill you in on all the details. Um, less good news is reproductive rights. And I'm, I'm sure you're quite aware of some of the things going on, but I wanted to kind of um, get, get you up to date on some of the things that are happening and also talk about um, some of the things you may not be hearing all that much about that I think is really important to keep in mind as we go through what I see as a major transition time with regard to reproductive rights and abortion rights in particular. Um, you know, part of the reason we're in such a major transition time is the huge shift that has occurred on the Supreme Court that began um, with um, the Senate's refusal to um, confirm Merrick Garland, Obama's nomination to the court, to take the place of Scalia when he passed. And then, of course, Trump got the appointment of Gorsuch, and then he got two more appointments. Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett. And so the court has moved from a relatively balanced 5-4 split with Kennedy in the center as a kind of swing vote to a very skewed 6-3 conservative liberal split. And that's what you see on this um, seesaw here. And, you know, there's a lot of issues that are influenced by this major shift towards a conservative supermajority on the court, but reproductive rights is certainly one of them. And one of the most recent ways in which this became clear is um, the Supreme Court allowed a Texas abortion ban to go into effect, a ban that clearly violates Roe versus Wade, but was developed in such a way to make federal court review difficult. And the major conservative majority of the court went along with that and allowed the law to go into effect. The second important reproductive rights case before the court is a case that will likely either overturn or significantly um, cut back the right to abortion that was originally established close to 50 years ago with Roe versus Wade. And you know, in response to the shift on the court, um, state legislatures across the country and conservative states have been passing tons of anti-abortion 
legislation, um, actually record-breaking numbers of laws. And so um, you see this um, statistic. In 2021, 19 states enacted a record 106 abortion restrictions, including 12 bans. And because the Supreme Court um, has indicated its you know, willingness to potentially overturn Roe and to uphold the Texas ban, many states are passing copycat laws or they're considering copycat laws to use a, a strategy similar to the Texas case to stop abortion even before the court rules on the, the Roe case, um, which they will do next summer. So just briefly, um, the case that could potentially overturn Roe is called Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. It involves a Mississippi ban at 15 weeks of gestation. The Fifth Circuit, which is a pretty conservative circuit, ruled that the ban was unconstitutional, which it clearly is under Roe. And the Supreme Court kind of hemmed and hawed for a couple of years about whether to take the case. And it wasn't until Amy Coney Barrett got on the court that they did. And it's, you know, I'm sure because they got this solid supermajority of conservatives. So um, the oral arguments were December 1st. And the issue is whether all pre-viability bans on abortion violate the U.S. Constitution. So whether to uphold this Mississippi ban or whether to just entirely overturn Roe. And that became clear in oral arguments that that is, that is a very likely result. The kind of comments that were made by the Supreme Court justices indicate that there's clearly a majority uh, prepared to overturn Roe. As I said, the ruling will be next summer, and if it happens, 26 states are likely to ban abortion. And this, tw this number comes from the Guttmacher Institute, which is a research institute that keeps track of state laws on abortion. So that's kind of where we stand. Um, just briefly, also, to give you more details about the Texas case, the law was called SB8, and it bans abortion at around six weeks. And rather than having the state enforce it so that, you know, abortion providers could sue the state, they created a private enforcement mechanism that allows any private citizen to sue somebody who helps somebody get an abortion. And that includes doctors, but it also includes, you know, family members if they help you pay for it or drive you to the doctor or give you information about how to get one after six weeks. Um, it went up on emergency appeal to the Supreme Court um, in two different cases, one brought by providers called Whole Women's Health versus Jackson, and the other brought by the U.S. Justice Department, Merrick Garland. And it was argued before the court on November 1st. Um, and, you know, the, the court allowed it to go into effect on September 1st and, and didn't stand in the way. And then um, they argued it on November 1st and decided to leave it in effect. And so it's now the case, you know, there is a case, but it's slowly working its way up um, the court system and is unlikely to get before, get any decision before the summer's decision in the Dobbs case. So basically abortion is um, illegal in Texas after six weeks, which is before many, many people know they're pregnant. Um, so, okay, so with that in mind, I don't actually think the courts are a very effective way to protect or expand or vindicate reproductive rights at this point. Donald Trump appointed over 200 judges across court, the federal court system, and it's, it's a pretty grim court system. And so there's a shift in the movement towards trying to develop other strategies to protect abortion rights. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about. And the first strategy is rather than looking to the feds, the federal courts, or even the federal government, to turn to the states. And we here in Massachusetts have done that quite effectively. So in 2018, shortly after Brett Kavanaugh got appointed to the court, um, we passed what was called the Nasty Woman Act, which removed criminal abortion bans that were still on the books from before Roe versus Wade. And so that was really, really significant. But, you know, as, you know, things developed, folks said, you know, we need not only um, to eliminate criminal bans, but we need an affirmative right to abortion. And we need to remove some of the obstacles that still exist in Massachusetts, like parental consent, 
Uh, we still had a 24 hour waiting period on the books, even though it was not enforceable and other things. So after much lobbying, um, advocates got the Roe Act passed in December of 2020 over the veto of our governor, Governor Baker. And that was huge because it created an affirmative right to abortion. And why that was important is, is that if Roe versus Wade gets overturned, we will still have abortion rights here in Massachusetts. And so, you know, we are not alone in passing state level laws. Illinois did it, New York did it, several other states have been passing these affirmative protections of abortion rights in preparation of the Supreme Court, you know, possibly or likely overturning Roe. Um, so we're pretty, we're in a pretty good position right now. The other thing that was sort of monumental about the Roe Act is we became the very first state to overturn a parental consent law. So um, we were actually one of the very first to institute a parental consent law shortly after Roe that required anybody under 18 to get their parents' consent to access reproductive or abortion health care. You don't need it to get any other kind of reproductive health care, but you need it only for abortion. And so what the Roe Act did is it eliminated it for 16 and 17 year olds. So it still exists for under 16, but most it's there's very rare cases under 16. It was, you know, I think 75 or eight, maybe even 85 percent of parental consent cases were 16 and 17 year old people. Many times it was low income kids who were in foster care who couldn't get a hold of their parents, or it was situations where parents were either incarcerated or worked three jobs and couldn't go to the doctor with their kids. And so, um, so you know, this was a real, a real victory for the movement. There is also other re, um, reproductive rights legislation currently pending before the Massachusetts legislature that advocates are working on. And you can go, um, NARAL is now called Reproductive Equity Now, and they have a, a legislative agenda on their website with a number of really important laws that folks are fighting for right now that regard all kinds of things, access to contraception, as well as access to abortion. What I wanted to flag, because I've been working on this very closely with Representative Lindsay Sabadosa, who is a local rep, it's called an act to require public universities to provide medication abortion. So medication abortion is abortion pills, and you can take them through 10 weeks, and they basically cause a miscarriage. And they're, they're safer than Tylenol. They're very, um, um, you know, it's like having a heavy period if you take it early. And um, although it can be painful if you take it a little later. And um, right now, public universities in Massachusetts do not offer medication abortion. They could, but they don't. And, you know, all it is, is is basically prescribing medication, but they don't do that. And this legislation would require the 13 public universities in the state of Massachusetts to provide this service. From research, um, the many of these, um, you know, healthcare providers want to provide it and students want it to be provided on campus. In addition, I conducted some research showing how far people have to travel to get to abortion clinics in Massachusetts from university campuses. So for instance, if you're at UMass and you want to go to Planned Parenthood in Springfield, it's going to be 50 miles round trip. And if you have to take buses, it's going to take two hours and 18 minutes each way. And, you know, you can see for other states, I mean, other state universities. Now, you know, there are providers who provide this medication closer than abortion clinics, but a lot of times people don't know about that because they don't advertise it because they're afraid of getting targeted by anti-abortion protesters. And so this legislation would make this service uh, more available so that students don't have to try to figure out how to get it off campus and travel long distances to get it. So that's that's a really important piece of legislation. And I encourage you to contact your legislators. Um, Mindy, um, I mean, uh, Joe Comerford is a co-sponsor, as, as is um, um, Lindsay Sabadosa. Mindy Dome is not a co-sponsor. 
Uh, I think she supports it, but she has not signed on yet. And that would be great if she would. Um, and then, you know, most of the other local reps are co-sponsors of this bill. So it's hugely important. Um, all right, so I wanna say a little bit more about medication abortion, and I wanna make sure I stay within my time period. This has been an issue that I have been writing a whole lot about for Ms. Magazine. And um, during the pandemic, a lot of medicine went telemedicine, right? I'm sure you all now have had telemedicine appointments. Maybe you hadn't before the pandemic. And the FDA lifted all kinds of restrictions on different medications so that they could be distributed via telemedicine, except for one medication, which was the abortion pill, which is because of politics heavily restricted. And historically, um, the FDA did not allow it to be mailed. And the Trump administration did not lift the requirement of in-person distribution for abortion pills. And advocates sued and a federal court in Maryland required the Trump administration to allow physicians to mail abortion pills. And Trump appealed that to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court overturned that decision. And then Biden got um, into office and he lifted that restriction. So bottom line is telemedicine abortion began to be available across the country beginning in about July of 2020. And it was a little bit of a pendulum, but um, you know, once Biden got into office, he lifted it in, um, let's see, I guess in April. And then he directed the FDA to review this in-person distribution requirement. And in December of last year, the FDA permanently lifted the in-person distribution requirement. So now physicians and other qualified medical professionals can have a telemedicine visit with a patient and mail abortion pills to them. And what's revolutionary about this is it means that people don't have to cross protest lines. People don't have to travel long distances to abortion clinics to get these pills. They can access, access them much more easily. And by the way, whether you go to a clinic or not, you always take them at home anyway. So the process is not any different. You always, it, it happens over about two to three days. So you're always gonna be taking them at home and you know, um, bleeding you know, you're, and then you know, using pads and, and the pregnancy would end as if, as if it were a miscarriage. So um, after the lawsuit in Maryland allowed telemedicine abortion, all these virtual clinics began to pop up across the country in states that allowed telemedicine abortion. Just the Pill started in Minnesota, Choice started in California, Carafem started in Georgia, Hey Jane started in, um, where were they? I think they were in Colorado. Anyway, a lot of these places started and they were hugely popular. And um, now that um, telemedicine abortion is legal in the green states on this map, these virtual abortion clinics or just regular brick and mortar clinics offering telemedicine abortion have vastly expanded across the country. So now in the state of Massachusetts, we have quite a number of virtual abortion providers, groups like the Lilith, um, Lilith fund, I think it's called, Forward Midwifery, um, Aid Access, um, Planned Parenthood also provides telemedicine abortion in the state of Massachusetts now. And it's much cheaper than in-clinic abortion. In-clinic abortion on average across the country is about $550. Here in Massachusetts, it's about $700 at Springfield Planned Parenthood. But by telemedicine, it's as low as $150. You can get a um, telemedicine abortion in Massachusetts for $150. So it's, it's huge and um, it's making it much more accessible, both as far as convenience, but also economically. Now, you're probably wondering why are some of these states gray and why are some of them green? So the gray states don't have telemedicine abortion yet. 19 of them ban it. And the others have other kinds of restrictions that make it hard. And um, there is an issue whether banning telemedicine abortion isn't preempted by the FDA decision, but that has not been litigated yet. So right now it's not available in the gray states. 
But folks are thinking very creatively about how can we get folks in these gray states to um, have greater access to abortion pills and to telemedicine abortion. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the strategies that people are using to do this. There is this amazing woman named Dr. Rebecca Gompers. She's Dutch, but she now lives in Austria. She is a physician and she offers telemedicine abortion services from abroad to everyone in the United States, including in those gray states. It's, um, she uh, does a telemedicine, abortion, uh, telemedicine appointment and she does it via online forms. She reviews folks' medical information. And then if they qualify, she prescribes medication abortion. She sends the prescription to a reputable pharmacy in India, and it's mailed to patients in the United States, including places like Texas. It's She charges um, $150, and it's a sliding scale. So if you can't afford it, she'll give it to you for free. I interviewed her just recently. I'm doing a piece for Ms. on her. She says about a third of her of her patients get it for free. She has served about 30,000 people since 2018 in the United States alone. She also offers advanced provision pills. So if you just wanna have some pills on hand in case you end up with an unwanted pregnancy, you can order them from her. So you can just keep them in your medicine cabinet. While the FDA still considers it illegal for overseas pharmacies to ship medications into the US, this is done all the time because it's less expensive. And the FDA has a policy of non-enforcement of um, about importation of medications from abroad, um, as long as you get a limited supply, a 90-day supply. It is not illegal to um, self-manage or to take abortion pills, um, except in five states make it illegal to self-manage your own abortion. But this isn't even really self-managed abortion. It's just abortion with a provider outside the country. Now, you know, I'm sure Texas doesn't like this, that she's doing it, but she's not breaking any laws in Austria. And, um, you know, I'm sure that conservative legislators will try to find ways to make this illegal and potentially even go after pregnant people or women ordering these pills. But um, right now, it's happening on a widespread scale. And again, it's very safe. Dr. Gompertz has a help desk where people can call if they have any issues. But again, tell these abortion pills are safer than Tylenol. They're safer than shellfish. They're really, really safe. And so, um, you know, it's, it's what folks are doing. As abortion becomes less accessible, you know, with, between the internet and abortion pills, it's... It, you know, the cat's out of the bag. They are not going to be able to stop people from getting these pills. Now, the one disadvantage of aid access is it takes a couple of weeks because it's shipped from um, India. And so in the states that allow telemedicine abortion, Dr. Gompertz has U.S.-based clinicians that work with patients and mail the drugs from within the United States within a couple of days. So, um, she, um, you know, it only takes that longer amount of time if you're in some of the other states. Um, I am almost done. Um, the other thing is there's um, an amazing organization called Plan C, and you can find them at plancpills.org. They have a comprehensive website with information on medication abortion. It explains how to access pills, including telemedicine services, online pharmacies, and reliable websites selling the abortion pill from abroad. So you can actually just order abortion pills online um, and from outside of the United States, like folks order a lot of medications. Um, and you know, I, most of them come from India, as do most of these um, pharmaceuticals where you order them online. Um, and what Plan C does is that they have vetted a number of websites and tested the pills that they receive. And so you can find out websites that are reliable. The cost of these websites actually are more than aid access sometimes. They, they have a, there's a range of costs and Plan C says how, how, how much they cost. The Plan C website also has a searchable um, a, a, a sort of a drop-down menu, and you can search it by state. 
and it says exactly what the options are, where you live, and the legality of different options, and how to access abortion pills. Um, in addition to ordering pills online or using aid access, folks in states where it's not legal to use telemedicine are doing a number of things. They're using mail order, excuse me, mail forwarding from other states, or they're um, they're traveling to states like to like they'll drive right over the border. So let's say you live in in Alabama, they drive over the border into Georgia, they do a telemedicine visit with a doctor in Atlanta, and then the doctor sends the pills to um, an address in Georgia. So you can use a mail forwarding address, or um, if you have a friend, they can receive it, and then you can pick it up from your friend. So people are using a lot of really creative ways to access abortion pills. Um, but it's, you know, it's a lot of people don't know about this. So Plan C is doing a lot of media work to try to raise awareness about access to abortion pills. They're doing a lot with social media to reach young people and, and using other avenues as well. Um, so that's all the, um, one other thing I'll just say briefly about the FDA is um, they still do restrict abortion pills. Um, and so, you know, there's still a lot of efforts to try to get them to make abortion pills like any other medication um, fully accessible without barriers. Um, the other thing that's happening with the FDA right now is they have a um, application right now to make birth control pills over the counter. And they are likely to approve that this year. England made two birth control pills over the counter last year. Um, many countries have over the counter birth control pills. We do not here in the United States yet, except for going to a pharmacist. Some states, um, I think 16 states allow a pharmacist to prescribe abortion pills. So that's sort of over the counter. Um, but um, it is likely that the FDA is gonna approve an over the counter birth control pill from the company Cadence sometime this year. The other thing is there are two pieces of legislation before Congress that would expand abortion rights, the Women's Health Protection Act. It's been passed by the House, but it's being held up by the filibuster in the Senate. And I don't see that going anywhere with the current Senate. There's also the Each Woman Act, which would guarantee Medicaid funding for abortion health care, as well as insurance coverage. Um, that as well is not likely to pass the Senate. But it's important to know about that because economic barriers are really a, you know, real significant barrier. You know, 75 percent of people who get abortions are low income. And so when you don't allow insurance to cover it and you don't allow um, Medicaid to cover it, it is a significant barrier for the people that need this care. And that's why we have over 80 abortion funds across the country that help to close that gap. Okay, I was gonna say, oh, one other quick thing is if abortion becomes illegal and uh, 26 states make it, you know, ban abortion, um, I, folks really need to know about crisis pregnancy centers. There are three times as many crisis pregnancy centers as licensed abortion clinics in the United States. Crisis pregnancy centers are basically anti-abortion organizations that pretend to be medical clinics, they pretend to be abortion clinics, and they try to delay women's access to real reproductive care. So they wear white lab coats, they have ultrasound machines, they wear stethoscopes around their neck, they, they try to mislead people into thinking that they're abortion clinics, and then set, try to put them off for as long as possible. So by the time they get to abortion clinics, it's too late to get an abortion or it's much more expensive and there's more barriers. And 98% um, of people in the United States live equidistance or closer to a crisis pregnancy center than to an abortion clinic. Um, many CPCs receive state funding. There's over $40 million of, of public money that goes to CPCs across the country not in states like Massachusetts, but in many Southern states and Midwestern states. Um, CPCs target low-income people and people of color, people that already don't have access to medical care often. And, you know, it's a public health crisis. 
um, maternal mortality and morbidity, morbidity. And if they are blocking access to reproductive health care, it, it can have really negative repercussions for, for um, women's health. And um, so, but the reason that I bring them up today is that they collect a tremendous amount of information from people who come to them. And people think they're HIPAA protected, but they're not because they don't charge anything and they don't file insurance claims. And what's happening, and I've written about this uh, for Ms. and other outlets, they are collecting a vast amount of information about when people are pregnant and when they're not, what their reproductive health history is. And my concern is in those conserve those 26 states that might ban or likely to ban abortion if Roe gets overturned, crisis pregnancy centers become the eyes and the ears of the anti-abortion state. They can take this information and share it with criminal prosecutors or other people. And, you know, again, they, they have very sophisticated digitized, you know, databases of, you know, when people, a lot of them run period tracking apps and then collect that information and they can find out when people are pregnant. And, and my concern is that, you know, uh, this becomes sort of a digital surveillance state where they are tracking women's, you know, cycles and when they were pregnant, when they're not pregnant, and that they will use this information to block access to abortion. And just recently, there was legislation introduced in Oklahoma to do this. Um, to create a statewide database of um, women's reproductive behaviors. Now, it hasn't passed, but it, but it um, was introduced. And I can share links to any of this if you're interested or speak more about any of this. So I was going to say a little bit about the ERA, but I realize I've gone way too long. And so I'm going to say very little about the ERA. Um, the 38th state ratified the ERA on January 27th, 2020. Um, the third section of the ERA says it will go into effect uh, uh, two years out of ra after ratification. So Virginia was a 38th state. It takes 38 states to ratify an amendment. It was two years as after January 27th. Um, and um, so technically, the Equal Rights Amendment is in effect. However, um, whoops, sorry, these two not very handsome fellows as well as um, a lot of other Republicans in particular, have blocked the ERA from being published. And um, they blocked the archivist from publishing the ERA and certifying that it had met all the requirements. And so while um, many constitutional scholars are saying that it is in effect, that their strategies to block it are not, do not follow Article 5 of the Constitution, it is unclear and it will ultimately end up in the courts, the courts that have been heavily stacked against women's rights. Um, advocates in Congress are pushing um, to get it recognized, um, to say it's been validly certified um, and, and ratified. But um, I guess, you know, this is not getting a lot of attention in the mainstream press, but I think it's a really important issue because I think we need an ERA. ERA. I think if Donald Trump showed us anything. It showed us that we can't count on statutory laws or even, you know, something like the 14th Amendment. We need explicit constitutional guarantees for women's equal rights in the U.S. Constitution. So I think this is an important thing to keep an eye on um, if you're if you're concerned about women's rights. All right. I'm going to stop there because I already went on too long, but I'm willing to talk about any of that or anything else that you're curious about as far as the law. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, just to remind everyone, just um, use the reaction, raise hand to raise your hand if you have a question or just physically raise your hand. And if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask. Martha. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Baker. I, I follow you in Ms. Magazine. I follow you in the Gazette. You and I email. And so happy to meet you in person. I live in South Hadley. I'm not a member of the League of Women Voters, although we, South Hadley has its own model called Know Your Town, but we're not an official League of Women Voters. So I thank you for letting me attend this. Um, I just had a few comments um, on, on the law and um, 
I, I wrote them all down here. I'll try to be brief. First two comments. Why are men involved in women's uterus? Certainly we're not involved in men's Viagra. We're not involved in men masturbating. <laughs> Why are men involved in women's re reproductive health care? I, 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 I don't understand that. And number two, I wanted to ask you, how much of this opposition to abortion is religious based? Mm -hmm. So the US Catholic um, Conference of Bishops has played a really central role in abortion opposition all along the way. And um, they also, by the way, are the major uh, force against the Equal Rights Amendment because they fear that the Equal Rights Amendment will strengthen reproductive rights as well as women's rights more generally. So, and, and in addition to the Catholic um, bishops, and I distinguish Catholics from the Catholic bishops and even the Catholic church because um, most Catholics support reproductive rights. Catholic women use contraception at the same rates as non-Catholic women. They get abortions at the same rates. So I really think, and it goes to your first question about men. I mean, I, I think that, and, you know, by the way, there are many men that support reproductive rights and are leaders in the reproductive rights movement. But, um, you know, your question was, why do men have a say at all? Um, you know, I think that these guys, these U.S. Catholic bishops who are supposedly celibate, but certainly have never had babies and never been married to women that have had babies and never probably changed a diaper, um, they certainly have strong opinions. And, you know, and they have a right to have their opinions um, as religious people. The question is, do they have a right to impose it on everybody else, particularly on other religious people that have different religious beliefs? But they have certainly, um, along with evangelicals, who also are very active in the anti-abortion movement, um, are able to influence legislation at the state level and at the federal level and now in the Supreme Court um, quite significantly. And I think I quite... I think it's a First Amendment problem. I think that we, you know, we shouldn't allow religious belief to become the law that imposes the standards on everybody. Now that said, there are non-religious people that oppose abortion too. So it's not only a religious belief, but it, you know, certainly politically, like who is the power, the force behind anti-abortion laws and all of that, it is religious people, absolutely, in the United States. And as far as why, you know, you know, I, I in my gender law and policy class, I have this um, cartoon that I show of a panel of like older women. And it says, you know, Viagra approval panel, you know, and, you know, it's, it's kind of a tongue in cheek thing. And I put it next to a real image of, you know, Senate panels of men making decisions about reproductive rights. I mean, it is, it's such an irony that, you know, it's, it's usually predominantly uh, men and largely white men who have the vast majority of say over women's reproductive rights and access um, to reproductive care more generally. And, and it's not about, you know, women's well-being or else they pay a lot more attention to maternal mortality and morbidity. It's very much, in my opinion, about controlling women yeah. and maintaining male dominance. And, and by the way, it also is very tightly connected to race and white supremacy as well. And, and that's a whole nother issue, but I, 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 I deeply believe that. And, and I can provide sources for you if you want to go down that rabbit hole. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to ask about the Texas abortion ban, um, which, you know, at six weeks basically outlaws abortion. Women just don't know either even pregnant then. Um, where are these women going? Is, you know, yeah. when we think of the, um, the movement, you know, the Underground Railroad, to you know, escort slaves to free territories. Do we? I read that maybe we're getting into that because if if the Supreme Court restricts abortion, either going through this um, fifteen week one or letting the Texas one stand, all these other states are going to just have a trigger and be right in line with them. Are we going to have some kind of uh, underground railroad to get women? to states like Massachusetts. Yeah. And if we do have this, is there going to be funding for it? And mm. the other thing is, now Texas got away doing this through the legislature. Now, remember in 
Pennsylvania, they tried to legislate, what is it, mail-in voting or something through the legislature. And that went to, um, did, did that go to the Supreme Court or is that just the state Supreme Court of uh, Pennsylvania? I can't remember, that was very recent. They said I that- I think it was the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, the, yeah. Okay, they said that you can't legislate these things. They have to be through the, whatever it is, uh, I can't remember through the uh, constitution of the state. I can't remember, I'd have to look that up. But it just seems like Texas got away with this. The Supreme Court did absolutely nothing. And number one, where are these women going? And what if another state tried to do this with gun rights? New York is doing this. New York is passing a SBA type law on guns. Have you heard this? Yeah, they're doing it. And, and you know, to some degree, I think it's to make the Supreme Court think long and hard about whether ultimately they're going to allow this because it's a double edged sword for the right. But um, your question on what Texas women are doing. So I am doing a series right now for Ms. Magazine where I'm interviewing telemedicine abortion providers. And a lot of them are, and this is from in states where it's legal, a lot of them are serving women in Texas. So for instance, I interviewed a woman, Just the Pill, um, which is based in Minnesota, Dr. Ammon. And she, what's happening is, um, oh no, this was um, Allison Case, who's up in, she works for Whole Women's Health in Indiana. She's not allowed to do it in her own state, but she's she has a license in New Mexico. And so what's happening is women in Texas are driving over the border into New Mexico, doing a telemedicine appointment with her in Indiana. And then the pills are being mailed to New Mexico and they're picking them up. So they're doing them either general delivery to a post office or they're mailing it. Like a lot of the women are just hanging out in a hotel for a day or two. And, and, Dr. Case is mailing the pills to the hotel and they're getting them in the hotel and then taking them back to Texas. Um, women are definitely, you know, women are just traveling over the border, uh, either by plane or by, by car and going to brick and mortar clinics in, in surrounding states all around. And, and it's reverberating outward. So like women are going to Louisiana or they're going to New Mexico or Colorado. And then those clinics are getting really packed and then, um, you know, it's, it's reverberating out. So I interviewed somebody up in Washington state who was actually getting people reverberating up all the way up there. And so it's, it's a huge burden because remember, 75% of people who get abortions are low income. They don't have the money to be traveling long, long distances or taking time off from work or getting childcare. Because remember, like 60% of people who get abortion already have children that, you know, kids that they're taking care of. And so this is where abortion funds come in and where clinics to some degree. I mean, Whole Women's Health is working to get folks access. You know, so Whole Women's Health is the one of the main clinics in Texas. They opened a clinic like right over the border so people can, and they're, you know, they're referring people to those. And, but it's all, it's all workaround and it's all very burdensome. And, um, you know, it's, we're in a crisis situation for people in Texas. Many people are just not getting the care they need. And, you know, I guess, you know, using Amy Coney Barrett's strategy, going to the baby safe haven places and giving the children over. I, I don't, I don't know. But, um, you, but the other thing, by the way, that's happening is that there is a real effort to get people care quickly under six weeks. But, you know, six weeks, remember, it's, it's bans at six weeks, but that's, that counts from your last period. So it's really only four weeks past conception. Because you know how you, you have your period, there's two weeks, then you get pregnant, and, and, but your pregnancy is counted. You know, when we say pregnancy is 40 weeks, that's from your last period, not from when you actually got pregnant. So really, it's a four-week ban. And, and remember, you know, you presumably get your period after, you know, two weeks later. And then, so you don't even know until four weeks pregnant that you've missed a period. And then you have two weeks to get the abortion. And, you know, it, as you said, it's, it's basically many people don't even know they're pregnant in six weeks. And so it's, it's been a huge ban, a burden. And I, I know that initially about 50% of people were still getting access to abortion. I don't know if that's gone down, 
I, I haven't heard the recent numbers. So, you know, people were hurrying and getting it early, but um, 50 were not. So, um, you know, they were going out of state or going somewhere else or not getting it at all. Thank you. Yeah. Barbara, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, I just can't get my head around Texas and this bounty hunting. I mean, what people call it bounty hunting. Yeah. And is there, pres is there precedent besides the Fugitive Slave Act or something um, for this kind of thing? There actually is. Texas passed, you remember white primaries? Do you remember the white primaries that, that in the Southern states, they would they would basically give private groups the right to run primaries. And then the private groups would block black people from participating in primaries. And that's how they would keep, the, that's the exact same strategy that was used. And it was struck down by the Supreme Court in the fifties in a case called um, Texas versus Powell. So they're reviving a Jim Crow era strategy to try to block African Americans from, you know, getting access to public services and public rights um, without making the states suable. So they were doing an end run around the Constitution. That's the same strategy they're using today. And, and ultimately, I think that this law will be struck down because of that. But again, the Supreme Court, they're using a bunch of procedural things to just delay it as long as possible, I think, until they can overturn Roe. It, it's a ridiculous law. It, it undermines the power of the court. It undermines the Constitution. You could do this with any constitutional right. I mean, you know, the government could allow private citizens to shut down churches. You know, they could say, if you shut down churches, we'll give you a $10,000 or, or you can sue, you know, I mean, they it, it makes absolutely no sense. It absolutely undermines the um, rule of law. And so I don't think ultimately it will up, it will be upheld. I think it's a temporary measure, but I think, you know, in the meantime, it's blocking women's access to abortion. I wrote a, a piece about this that I can share with you about how this is an end run around the constitution, how it revives this Jim Crow era strategy. Um, I, it, it's, it's one of my Ms. articles. But I'm just so thrilled to hear you say that New York is going to use it for guns. Can yes. We, can we jump on a, a big bandwagon to do this and do all these anti, you know, things they don't want to have it happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we could. I mean, I, I obviously I think the gun lobby is going to push tremendously against it. But, you know, I, I think it would be good if a few of these kinds of bills did pass. So then when it did get before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court would you know, it'd be very clear that if they held the strategy, that it would hurt issues they care about as well as issues that they don't yes, care no, about. Wonderful. Yeah. Carol, go ahead with your question. Just uh, remember to unmute yourself. So I was um, I was wondering about those crisis uh, pregnancy centers. Um, and the, the tracking that they that they were going to be doing. Um, don't they have to follow HIPAA privacy laws? How could they do that? So they're not medical clinics. They don't charge for their services and they don't bill insurance. HIPAA applies to medical oh. providers who bill insurance. Yeah. And so they look like they're medical providers, but you know, they wear white lab coats and, but they, um, they aren't, so they're not subject to HIPAA. And so people think that they're, they're providers, so they fill out the forms and give the information, often pretty confidential, about like STDs and previous abortions and you know when, when their last period was. And they think that's gonna be protected information. I and that. I wrote a piece for the Women's Media Center, and this is actually an ongoing area that I'm writing in, um, and there's a there was a report put out by an organization, a digital privacy organization, about how CPCs are collecting this information and sharing it. So the 
individual CPCs are look like mom and pops, but they're all connected to these huge organizations like Heartbeat International or Birthright, you know, all these big anti-abortion organizations. And they're sharing the information. It's going into these databases. And it's unclear what they're doing with it at this point. But my concern is potentially they could share it with state prosecutors in states that are anti-abortion at some future date. Uh, if if Roe got overturned and bans went into effect, and so it you know it's it's a real concern. Um, I'm actually working on a piece right now that hopefully will be in the New York Times it, 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 in the opinion section. Um, we'll see. It'll be my first piece. This has been a goal of mine for a while, but it's on CPCs, and so I I'll be writing more about this topic. I think Thank we have uh, time for another one more question. We'll squeeze in. Susan, if you want to go ahead. Hi. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you very much, Carrie. This has been really informative. I have a question about the ERA. Yeah. I thought, and I lived in Virginia back in the 70s or 80s when we did not vote for it, um, but I thought there was an expiration date on the legislation, so you, you on the constitutional amendment, so you had to have it passed by a certain date. What has happened to that? Okay, so in the original... Um, amendment that was passed by Congress in 1972. In the preamble to the amendment, there was a seven-year time deadline. After seven years, and there were not, there were only 35 states that ratified, and you need 38, um, they extended, Congress extended the deadline another three years to 1982. There were no further ratifications. In 1992, um, a amendment written by James Madison, was finally ratified over 200 years later. It was an amendment. It was the 27th Amendment. It says that Congress can't vote themselves a pay raise. It had originally been inter introduced as part of the um, um, Bill of Rights, the first 12 amendments, never passed until 1992. And that gave the um, advocates the idea that, well, if we could get three more states to ratify the amendment and then get Congress to lift that time deadline, then we could have the ERA. And so when Trump got into office, um, Nevada uh, ratified in 2017, Illinois ratified in 2018, and Virginia in 2020. And we got the 38 states. And over 200 constitutional law scholars have said that because the time deadline was in the preamble, which was not ratified, by the 38 states, the 38 states only ratified the language of the ERA itself, that the preamble is not binding on the states, and that Congress could also just extend, the, remove the deadline. And actually, the House has passed legislation to remove the deadline. It is pending in the Senate. It could pass the Senate, but it's being filibustered. Um, it right now has 53 supporters, uh, no, 52 Collins and Murkowski supported, as well as the 50 um, Democrats. And um, so, you know, that's kind of where we stand. When um, Virginia ratified, Bill Barr wrote a Office of Legal Counsel memo saying that the time deadline was enforceable and so it's over. And um, so the archivist didn't record the ERA. That's the final step. The archivist sort of certifies that there have been 38 states and records it. But um, there's now pressure on Biden to withdraw that memo and to, to direct the archivist to certify. It will then end up in the courts. And so mm -hmm. who knows? But, um, you know, the, that's kind of where we stand. It's unclear. I mean, a lot of constitutional lawyers think that it is now the 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And, and there are a lot of people fighting for that. But that's kind of, in a nutshell, where we are. And if you want more of the details I've written for Ms. a lot on this topic and, and interviewed tons of constitutional law scholars and, you know, Jackie Spear and Carolyn Maloney and Ellie Smeal. And uh, I'm kind of like, that's one of my big issues. So. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the information. Yeah, absolutely. Adrian, go ahead. You have a question. I, I do, and I'll make it make it quick. I want to direct it, uh, Professor Baker. Uh, you're a gift to us in the Valley, but it's 
It's so important because we, we're a pretty progressive group out here, as you well know. Um, I appreciate your more national voice. Mm-hmm. You're filled with such energy, and you're looking at a group called the League of Women Voters. Uh, we happen to be here in Amherst, and, and all of the people who've joined us. What I'd like to say is that we are activists here. Uh, we supported the Row Act enthusiastically, writing hundreds of letters. Perhaps you know that our membership here in Amherst extends through both uh, Senator Joe Mindy, Mindy, of course, and Natalie Blay, and your own your own Lindsay Sabadoza, and I believe also um, Mr. Carey. So we've got a pretty yes. large organization. And with that having been said, I would like to ask a quick question. It's on what I consider a very important follow-up to the Roe Act in this state, although there are several, and that's the one you spoke of. It is the H3841 Senate 1470. Now, I know that several of our representatives are on board. I'm really uh interested in the fact that our own Rep. Mindy of Hampshire County is not. So tell me, um, oh, how are we going to reach Mindy and support this uh, from your perspective? So I think she supports the law. She's just not yet signed on as a co-sponsor. And and I talked to her about this, actually, and she says that she is trying to talk to the different providers at the health centers before she signs on. So she's been calling and talking to like the medical directors at the different health centers. And and I'm not exactly clear why. Um, I think she feels maybe like it's a little bit of a one size fits all, but I think more it's just that she wants to talk to the health centers and see what their different needs are. So it may be that she eventually will. And I encourage you to encourage her to to sign on as a co-sponsor, because I feel like it's a really strong piece of legislation. We would be the second state in the country to do it. California did it in 2018. And we've been working very closely with California to get that, um, uh, to, to, you know, to, get guidance from them about how to do it here. So yeah, yeah, do encourage her. But I think whether she co-sponsors or not, she will, she will vote for it at the end of the day. It's, it's right now it's in the public health committee and the time has been extended. And, um, but we, we definitely need to make sure it moves on and doesn't, you know, just die or sit unvoted on. Yeah. But thank you. It's so wonderful to be here. I, I kind of have a long history with the League of Women Voters in various communities I've lived in over the years. I've I've been a member or come and spoken, and um, I think you're an amazing group. I love your legacy, your history, going all the way back to Alice Paul and the National Women's Party and the, the suffrage. And so I just um, I just thank you for your your activism and and you know remaining engaged. It's hugely important. And thank you so much. Oh, Andrea, do you want to say something? Just, just something I wanted to say to Martha Terry. Uh, Martha, I live in South Hadley also, and I'm a very active member of the Amherst League of Women Voters. It does extend to South Hadley. Please join us and let me find out about the thing that's here, because I'll be happy to be involved with that. But South Hadley doesn't limit you from being in the League of Women Voters of Amherst. So I just wanted to say that. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Baker. I'm going to go Back to Ms. I'm probably going to resubscribe like I need another magazine. <laughs> oh, please do. <laughs> yeah, you could be a member. They, they, they need support. They're a nonprofit and they do. Really I remember work. when I used to get it in a brown paper bag. So I was <laughs> <doing> well. <laughs> yeah. uh, go ahead, Martha. I just had a very, very quick closing comment. Thank you. I will look into. Um, joining up with the Amherst League of Women Voters. And Andrea, maybe you would look into joining Know Your Town in South Hadley. We have a website. Um, we're modeled on the League of Women Voters. We're just a little different. Um, I don't know when, I think we have men in our group. We're, but that's okay. I, I just want yeah, to- men. Men, men. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we were, we were all women until years ago. And then now we're co-ed, but that's okay. I, I you know, my mother recently died uh, during COVID. She didn't die of COVID, but she did die during the COVID crisis. And um, she was very, very political. So the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, but she was a woman of deep, deep Catholic faith. However, however, 
She said until she died because she used to follow politics all the time till she you know, couldn't hold up a newspaper anymore. And she would always say to me, get God out of the bedroom and get the government out of a woman's uterus. <laughs> Those are some of her last words. <laughs> thought I'd share them. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Professor Baker. We really enjoyed that talk. It was just a wonderful uh, bit of information about what the actual state of affairs is um, with, with abortion rights. I really appreciate the detail that you went into and all the other things. It was wonderful. Um, thank you for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope you all have a wonderful remainder of your weekend. And please do hang around to answer our survey, speaking of data, but we won't share it. <laughs> with inappropriate people, we promise. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. <laughs>